Greetings, friends and family. This is the day the Lord has made, and I shall rejoice and be glad in it. I, I choose to rejoice, even though the world seems to be trying its best to complicate things. Uh, this idea of trying to overcome temptation alone is the oldest trick in the, in the toothless one's arsenal. He, he has always tried to make us believe that we're self-sufficient and, and have everything under control. We could do it with our own intellect and our own wisdom. There goes an airplane. I'm sorry about that. That single lie has created, multiplied millions, even billions of failures. So Satan is not stupid. We know that. Uh, and he's not stupid because he, he knows he can use this whenever he can. Because, frankly, we fall for it a lot. While you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4 and Deuteronomy chapter 8, prepare your hearts for study. Let, let's pray. Father, as we uh, bask in this beautiful sunshine today, I thank you for the goodness that you bring into our lives, for the, the goodness that uh, knowing you, it just, it, it, it just changes everything. And I thank you for that reality. I pray that you will guide and direct our thoughts today as we particularly look at this, into this idea of trying to defeat temptation on our own. That, uh, so, certain way to be able to pray that you'll help us to understand, not just understand it, but to live it every day. Thank you for the, the, those who will be listening today. I pray that you will touch each of their hearts in a very unique and special way and show them your great love for them today. Love you, Father. Thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if, uh, if we're ever to defeat uh, or overcome temptation, at, as we first looked at last week, uh, we, we have to understand that, that foundational truth that, that temptations arise from within us, ourselves, our own desires, our, our predispositions. Uh, and, and as the Bible said, our, our desires are what drive us to, uh, to failure. Uh, and, and we are tempted to do things that we know full well are not good for us or are even, or even evil. Uh, and an ex example is if you have a predisposition to be negative, then you need to keep yourself away from, from other negative influences. Maybe it's, uh, you know, maybe it's the news 24-7 or maybe it's some, some neighbor that just likes to dump trash into your life. Uh, it, it, I don't, I'm not telling you to leave them out of it. I'm just telling you that you need to put barriers up. You might need to say, look, I love you. I just want you to understand that I don't, I, I can't handle this much negative thinking. I, I wish that you would, you would uh, brighten your day by thinking of good things today. Anyway, it's, it's not sufficient. Uh, it, this is not sufficient to win the battle by avoiding the battle, but it can reduce the number of skirmishes that, uh, that we face every day. Uh, it's easy for us to build fences around other people's problems because we can point out every, uh, problems in other folks real easily. Uh, but too often we think we're big enough or strong enough to battle through on our own. So before we begin our focus in Matthew 4 today, uh, let's look at some words Jesus from Jesus that shows us the immensity of our problem. Look at Matthew 7, verse uh, 13, 14. It'll be on the screen. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in in there, or in, in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Jesus is a is the perfect realist. He, he tells us in this very descriptive passage that we're up against uh, what we're up against and, and tells me that I have to, to make a decision to follow his way. I need to choose to do it his way. Uh, if we think up front that everything will be a bed of roses after we, we know G who Jesus is, we pretty much set ourselves up for, for complete failure, miserable failure. Life was never stated uh, as that it was going to be easy or fair. And unless we fully recognize the harsh realities that the easy way is filled with traps and dangers, we will never see the need to look to where our true hope comes from. 
Another reality we need to re recognize is that if we truly desire to follow close after Jesus or close to Jesus, we, we, we set ourselves up to become a target for Satan because he wants to destroy our testimony, if not our lives. Uh, I, I believe with all my heart that he, he cannot do anything that will completely destroy my, this, my relationship with Jesus, but he can certainly call it, that, that means I can't, be, I, I can't be lost after I've truly come to know him. But, but I do believe he can ruin my fellowship with him. And, I, and when I'm out of fellowship with Jesus, I'm no longer a threat to, to say he can go pick on somebody else. I can, I can become all but useless in, king, in the kingdom's work. Uh, let's begin today by looking at where we might think, where we might think was a rigged test when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. We're going to look at this in a, for a couple of weeks. Look at math, uh, Matthew 4, verses 1 to 4. Then Jesus, now that, well, I'll, I'll set the stage here in a minute. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Well, duh. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. First, let's look at the problem. Jesus has had been recognized by God at the River Jordan when John the Baptizer was was commanded by Jesus to baptize him. And it, it, was, it had to have been this emotional and spiritual high like nobody's business for not just the people who saw this, but for Jesus himself. Notice the Spirit led him into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness, specifically to where he could be, where he could be tried by the devil. The devil is not a clownish, red, uh, suited, forked tongue. Uh, you know, we have this world view of him being this impish uh, or clownish looking red suited thing that uh, walks around with a pitchfork and all that. That's not who he is. The, he, he is, remember, Lucifer fell from heaven because as the angel of light and the worship leader of heaven, pride over, overtook him, and, and it caused him to lose the position that he had. Uh, he, he must have been something. He, he must have been glorious to behold. And he didn't appear to Jesus as this clown trying to, you know, use a pitchfork to make, get him to do things. He appeared to him in his, he put his makeup on, he put, he put his best smile on, and he did everything he could to, uh, to defeat God's plan. Uh, he didn't come at Jesus with some far-fetched idea to tempt him, uh, something that he, he, you know, that he would have thought to do otherwise. In fact, since Satan knew Jesus was the creator, he knew Jesus was fully capable to do exactly what Satan told him to do as a human, fully human. Jesus must have been starving. He was. He must have been completely spent. No food for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, that, as an aside, uh, that the, the scripture is specific about the total fast for both days and nights. And the reason is, our Muslim friends make a big deal out of something called Ramadan. And we're in that right now. This period of time we're in is coming up to the close of it. Ramadan is a time of fasting for, the, for our Muslim friends. It, it lasts in this year. This year it was from March 22nd to April 22nd. Uh, I think that may, might be quite almost right. I think there's a, like the April 20th actually. And, and, it, and it calls for fasting by the adherents. The only difference is, is they can stuff themselves uh, be, before sunup and after sundown. Jesus went 40 days and 40 nights without anything to eat. So I lived in, or when I lived in Asia, we went, we went, to, we went to a place called Malaysia, uh, Kuala Lumpur, uh, and that place was is very, very much steeped in Muslim tradition. And then we were there during the, the holiday or fa the, the, well, 
it's a festival called Ramadan. And it could be pretty difficult to find something to eat during the day. But after the sun went down, <laughs> there were feasts galore everywhere you could go. I mean, some really fine food there. And I, I, I loved it. But sundown until sunup, they could eat all they could hold. Anyway, Jesus didn't have so much as a cracker, not even a communion wafer, uh, for 40 days and 40 nights. So he was famished. Uh, my pastor from High Point, uh, Jake, he, he did this fast. He, he, he did it, and he said it was the hardest thing he'd ever done. He, and he was in perfect health before he began. I mean, he was, uh, he, was the, he was an athlete, frankly. But he was almost stretched beyond his endurance. So Jesus gave himself to this fast so that he could relate to our appetites, whether it's Krispy Kreme or uh, the all you can eat buffet somewhere or uh, whatever the, the appetite you might exhibit. He was tempted in that area. So Satan came to, to Jesus as at his physically weakest moment and suggested that he just create some food. Again, something that was well within his power to do. But Jesus declared Old Testament scripture to Satan for what must have been, what must have seemed a little odd. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus defeated temp Satan's temptation. Again, there, there must have been a strong desire to eat by claiming there's much more important things than banana pudding. I'm trying to think of something offhand. No, I perhaps never, never, never mind. The real point is to this is that so this part of the test was that we should never do a good thing instead of the best thing or the right thing. Jesus could have done this and it would have been it would have been within his power to do it, but it wouldn't have been the right thing because he would have been obeying Satan's wishes rather than what he knew needed to be done. Uh, and if he had done it, he'd have been disqualified as my savior. The other two tests, and we'll be going over those a little bit detail next week I think and maybe the week after I'm not sure but they were also things that were within Satan's authority as uh, briefly uh, Satan tempted him to receive power from the world uh, and, and that and that is, that is to become the Messiah but it was under Satan's terms you do it my way and I'll make you the leader of the world right now you can have it all right now all you got to do is, is obey me and he also tempted Jesus to show off his power to achieve the world's acclaim. He said, jump off the building, and angel will save you. And boy, will the world be amazed at that. Both of these tests were, were turned away by Jesus quoting scripture. The reality was that Jesus could have done all these things with, within, again, within his own power. But, and this is a huge but, Jesus had to exercise God's plan in God's way in God's time. Anything Jesus might do at Satan's command would have rendered God's perfect plan of grace and mercy and forgiveness null and void. Jesus did not deviate from God's plan and neither should I, neither should you. How does the scripture point to our lesson title, the temptation to rely on my, my power instead of God? That's the title of the lesson today. Jesus used the power of God as spoken in scripture to defeat Satan's plan. His plan to have Jesus do something less or different to one, become my redeemer, and two, show me how to resist temptation under God's Holy Spirit. Now let's take a look at, Old Test at an Old Testament passage to see how this, uh, to see this in action from the very beginning. Uh, Deuteronomy 8 verses 1 to 5 every commandment which I command you today you must observe or be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart did he know? Did he not know what was in their heart? Of course he did, but he needed them to know what was in their heart. 
whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. It's an interesting foot swelling. You should know in your heart that as a man, as a man chastens his son, so the Lord, your God, chastens you. So they they got a, a major lesson when they heard what God had to say to Joshua, and because he's the one who's receiving these words now. Verse 3 is the passage that contains the verse that Jesus quoted when he was being at the temptation. Uh, if, if I could suggest a short passage for this whole passage, or a short translation for this whole passage, I'd say this. Listen and remember what my word says so that you don't have to wander around like your foolish ancestors. Remember that I gave you everything, everything you needed to live. That is what I call grace. That's what I love to call grace. That's what I love to call grace. You certainly, they certainly didn't deserve it. And he even provided mercy. Before I forget it, this is, uh, this is not scriptural. This is just, uh, uh, well, let, let's say, let's do follow the scripture to see what scripture says about this manna thing. It's found in Exodus 16, verse 15. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. I know what it was. This is my version of it. Captain Crunch is the closest thing I can think that came to it. Or maybe maybe a sweetened version of grape nuts. <laughs> yeah, there it was. An earlier passage described by the, the guy who was there during all these tough times, uh, Moses, said in Numbers 14, 16 to 35, where it says, and the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, or as they say in North Carolina, Aaron, how long shall I bear with this evil gener generation or congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints from the children of Israel uh, that they make against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number, from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb and Joshua, you shall by no means, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in. But your little ones, whom again I will bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds in this wilderness for forty years, and bear the brunt of your infidelity, and your, until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness, according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land. Ah, now we're getting to the reason they had to do this. 40 days that they spied out the land, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. Ooh, that's a fearsome thought. Unless, unless we think the plan was a dynamic thing, and God was uh, thinking on the, you know, on, the, on the go on this, uh, I, I don't think so at all. Well, I know so. This points out a passage of Scripture that is so important where it says, without faith it is impossible to leads God. The story of the spies could be a whole other Sunday school lesson, but it speaks volumes about that since Joshua and Caleb saw everything that the other ten spies saw, they saw the giants, they saw the, the wall cities, the, the weapons, the, every, everything that, although every spy saw the same thing, but they saw these giants, those giants, Joshua and Caleb, Caleb saw those giants through the wall eyes of God. So they weren't impressed by those giants. They weren't concerned about the giants because they knew God had directed them to take that land. The unfaithfulness of the people resulted in God's requiring them to waste time for 40 years, but worse, 
this is this is even worse than the waste. They felt God's rejection for the for those forty years. Those ten spies were thinking like we often do when we face some temptation, that we're fully capable to handle those, some things when we're not, and incapable to follow them or to defeat them. But with God, we would be able to. So let's finish our uh, Deuteronomy 8, verses 6 through 10 passage. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of, your, of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him, not be terrorized by him, but by being, be in awe of him, be respectful of him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of, of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron, and out of those of whose hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Once again, let me, let me render a short translation of this. Trust me, obey me, and you will have everything you need. Not everything you want necessarily, but everything you need. Let me be your fortress, and I will be your Lord. My, pro my problem is I, often that I, I fall into the, excuse me, this trap of thinking, I have everything I need to make me satisfied, when the reality is I need to lean into him more than ever, more than ever, when I think I'm, I'm doing okay. Self-delusion is a dangerous Thing because it keeps us from the best fellowship we can have. It pleases God when we fall to our knees and seek his face to help us and guide us. It, just trust him, obey him. Remember what I said last week, the Lord's Prayer might better be translated into English this way. Lead me away from temptation as you deliver me from the influence of the evil one. Our problem is we don't easily let go of the controls. Here I am, I'm working on a laptop today. I hate doing this. I'd rather use my notes, but my, I'm, I'm having to concentrate on the control. And when I'm concentrating on the, the controls, I, I, lose, I lose contact with you. And when I try to keep control of my life, I lose contact with God. Our problem is we don't easily let go. Don't let go of these controls. So, uh, some country western chica uh, once sung a, a song, Jesus Take the Wheel. I, I kind of think of his name or I don't know her name. Anyway, Jesus Take the Wheel. And that might be the best prayer for us today in this minefield that we live in, this uh, life that we find ourselves in. Jesus, please take the wheel of my heart. Let's pray. Father God, in this beautiful day that we're enjoying your blessings and the goodness of life and we forget to say thank you most of the time help us lord to remember that we can't do it alone we can't do it even a little bit alone we must i must trust you and i must obey you and i must let you fight my battles and win my wars because ultimately only those battles that you fight will be won Lord, thank you for my church. Thank you for my this class. I thank you for those who are listening in today, and I pray that you'll uh, remind them often how much you love them. And if they are, uh, if they're going through some sort of a dark valley right now, as as many of my friends are, I pray that you will uh, just wrap your arms around them and give them that holy hug and help them to to sense your very presence in their lives today. Thank you for life. Thank you for health. Thank you for the good things that you bring our way. Lord, we love you. We, we now ask that you have a special, uh, just a special time of worship as we present ourselves to you and show you that we love you. Help the worship to be a thing of uh, a special thing today. That it would be uh, a time of reflection, a time of commitment, a time of repentance. 
Lord, I pray for full souls to be saved in our services. I pray that our members would reach out to our neighbors and our friends and family and, and those who are hurting. I pray that you will help us to give them Jesus when they need a touch. Lord, thank you for all you're going to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, next week we'll be looking at a, another uh, temptation. That is the temptation to try to test God. Uh, I heard a preacher once say, sometimes preachers say, you pray and I'll pack when, a, when someone called them to a different church. That's, and he was saying it in jest, but uh, sometimes we test God because we think we can. Uh, we can. Well, we're going to be looking at more of the uh, Jesus testing in the wilderness in Matthew 4, so we'll move ahead in that. And then also, we're going to be looking at something in Deuteronomy 6. So I ask you again, please subscribe, like, and share this lesson, and we'll see you next week. May God richly bless you. Amen.